So that's the sack, pregnancy sack, mm -hmm. and that's the yolk sack, what you see here. Okay. And so that's the fetal pole, and you can see the fetal heart pulsations there. I feel like it's still your eggs and all that is happening there is just that they are assisting the conception. I was 26 when we started the process, my husband was 27. So everyone kept saying, you know, you're young, it'll happen. Ours was unexplained, so they couldn't explain why. So biologically, there seemed to be no real issue. Why Which I you think couldn't. is very common. And as that well. is a very common. And that actually, from a point of view of selling the concept of IVF to people, if somebody said that there's nothing wrong with you, people maybe weren't more willing to take that first step. In the UK, one in 50 births are now as a result of IVF treatment. And problems conceiving are very common, affecting an estimated one in seven couples. In vitro fertilisation is the process of taking either harvested or donated eggs and sperm and introducing them together in a lab environment to create a fertilised egg or embryo. The embryo is then transferred to the mother's uterus where it implants and continues to grow as a naturally conceived baby would. IVF treatment is used for many reasons, most commonly in cases of a low sperm count or low sperm motility in the male partner or blocked or damaged fallopian tubes in the female partner. It can also be used to create children in same-sex and single-parent families, where either donor or previously frozen eggs or sperm may be used instead. The process was first successful in 1978 with the birth of Louise Brown, the world's first IVF baby. Today, IVF is a well-established practice, and at the University of Kent, Professors Darren Griffin and Alan Thornhill are actively involved in the practice, regulation and future direction of IVF. So this is my research lab at the University of Kent. We're very interested in the mechanisms of how IVF works, and to do that we look at pig and cattle embryos as model systems. It's important to remember that this lab is a research lab. There's no clinical human IVF activity going on in there. But much of the things that you'll see, the equipment, the procedures and so on, are pretty much as will go on in a regular IVF lab. There are reasons for doing cattle and pig IVF just on their own, and that's to do with uh, food production. But as a model for human IVF, uh, as large mammals, cattle particularly has an awful lot of sim similarities in terms of their embryos to, to humans. Having a working lab on a, a large mammal species really gives us an awful lot of advantages to un understanding some basic questions about IVF. For women, IVF treatment starts with medication. Regular injections over a two-week period cause an increased production of eggs, allowing doctors to harvest many at once to improve the chances of fertilisation in the lab. The sperm is either introduced to the egg where the strongest sperm will penetrate the outer layer of the egg to fertilise it, or in cases of low sperm count or motility, a single sperm will be injected into the egg in a procedure known as ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. After five days, the embryos are assessed and to avoid multiple births, usually one embryo is transferred at a time. We've been trying um, for Joshua, for a baby, for about four years um, with no success. So um, we've sort of arrived at the decision for IVF based on sort of doctor advice and referral really um, after lots of medical tests and things like that. So yeah, it wasn't something we necessarily chose but it was a choice that we were given um, in order to try and conceive. Actually getting to the IVF process was um, a long road. Um, we went obviously through the NHS which involves lots of different tests, um, you have to qualify, so you have to be under a certain BMI, non-smoker, they're very thorough with their testing to make sure that you're good candidates and that there is nothing else that they can do naturally, because obviously it's an expense, a big expense on the NHS to put somebody through a round. In the UK, the regulatory body NICE advised that women should receive three cycles of IVF on the NHS if they are under 40 years old, and one cycle between 40 and 42 years old. If NHS cycles are unsuccessful, no further treatment is offered, and women are left to pursue private treatment instead. In recent years, however, the NHS in certain areas of the country has cut access to IVF treatment. Obviously, there is a health budget and it's got to go around a limited number of people, and all treatments in all areas of medicine are getting more and more expensive. Our treatment was NHS funded. Um, we were lucky enough in our sort of postcode lottery, they call it, 
Now we've had what they call a live birth, then we're no longer entitled to any more free NHS treatment. Our first treatment was NHS anyway, so we were very lucky. For me, I always felt like he was more special than anybody else type of thing because no, n at that moment nobody else ever had to go through this, you know, this sort of situation, which of course they have. Certainly that first week of euphoria and being, you know, sort of 30, what, 37, you know, you do think that, that potentially was something that was never, um, never going to happen. I would hate to think anybody that wanted to have a child that didn't have any children was denied it because they couldn't afford it. One of the ultimate aims of IVF research generally is to make it better, to make it as successful as it can possibly be. So the ultimate aim, of course, is that a couple will come in and they will have a one set of uh, egg collections and seminations and so on, and they will get pregnant from that. I really don't think the reason it's not funded is because it's not 100% effective or 50% effective. I don't think there's a group of people sitting around saying, um, once you get to this percentage success rate, we'll fund it. I think it's just quite an easy thing to cut. Although IVF is now commonplace, there is still much to improve, and Professors Griffin and Thornhill are at the forefront of continued research. The thing that we've been interested in a lot, for a long time is the idea of chromosomal disorders. So this is gross genetic abnormalities and how they can affect fertility. Now we do that both in humans, but also in model systems such as cattle and pigs as well. So what will happen here is we will receive um, ovaries and uh, sperm samples. From the ovaries, we'll get the eggs from them, get them into a sterile dish, and then ultimately we will move over to this cabinet here um, from which we can then expose the sperm to the eggs, hopefully to achieve fertilization. The advantage of being able to, to look at pig and cattle embryos is we can look at large numbers without uh, quite so many ethical constraints that are obviously you would need to have with, uh, with human embryos. So in that sense, we can look at a very large number of embryos and look at differences, uh, some of the factors that might affect the, the chromosome number, factors that might affect the, the development. We can do that in a test system, and then when we find that out and we narrow down some of the criteria, then we have the opportunity then to move into humans, but perhaps on a little bit much more smaller scale. Parents who are at risk of having children with genetic disorders can be offered testing of their embryos with only unaffected ones transferred, so-called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. The London Women's Clinic offers both regular IVF treatment and PGD. Patients are consulted and scanned at satellite clinics such as the one here in Canterbury. Today, Sajula, who is at risk of transmitting sickle cell disease, is here for her second pregnancy scan. We couldn't risk having natural conception because it means the offspring would be, could be sickle cell, we wouldn't know and if, if there's a chance of that, then we would either have to terminate before, before actually giving birth or you end up with a baby that is a sickle cell carrier. Sickle cell disease is a red blood cell disorder which is potentially life-threatening. IVF treatment with PGD means that Sedula's embryos can be screened before implantation to allow an embryologist to select only healthy embryos for transfer. Critics argue that this is the scientific community interfering to create a so-called perfect or designer baby. Designer babies are a little bit of a myth because in the, in the human setting you only have a very small number of embryos and from that uh, a small number of things that you could potentially look at. It would be completely impractical to try and screen the small number of embryos that you have for things like uh, good looks or intelligence or so on. So even leaving aside the ethical aspects, the practical aspects of actually doing some of the, um, the things that are brought up in the headlines of, of certain tabloids, it's not really practical to do. If you had IVF, uh, that included screening for cystic fibrosis, then one argument might be then uh, if you then have a, uh, a child who doesn't have cystic fibrosis, the, the cost and the effort and the emotional aspects of uh, bringing up a child uh, with that disease are far minimised. We didn't have any more testing as regards to Down syndrome and things like that as anybody else would. We still were tested at 12 weeks of pregnancy. but. Um, yeah, I think we probably would have taken the testing 
because, as I say, it's such a long, hard journey. When you get to the end of it, you just really, really want that healthy baby. It would, it would be doubly hard if little one wasn't very, you know, wasn't very healthy. IVF in the future, there's a lot of interest now in, uh, for instance, making the, the embryos, freezing them all, and then waiting until we, the, we think the, uh, the, the couple, and particularly mum, are physiologically ready, and then implanting one at a time. One of the biggest challenges is to ensure that we're using the best quality uh, eggs and sperm for, for patients. And we all know that people are delaying having their children, so I think we need a lot more fertility education for women to understand that, for example, if you're going to freeze your eggs, do it early, don't do it late. With some of the genome editing, the stem cell work that's going on, maybe they're not so distant after all. And maybe that would really crack the barrier to get to this 100% success rate, this one egg, one embryo, one child. That's the kind of holy grail. When we actually got to hold him, just disbelief. I think it took a long time to think actually he's ours and now we still look at him and we look at each other and think he's actually, you know, our baby and half of you and half of me and that's all we could have ever asked for.